the presentation of anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation economic social political and spiritual of the human race the emancipation Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Subverting Good Order. This is about some festivals of the early 1960s. After the horrors and rigours of the Second World War, Britain didn't exactly go to sleep, but it desperately wanted to return to an orderly way of life while enjoying the new consumer luxuries, the washing machines and cars and TV sets and so on. But by the end of the 1950s, the times they were changing again and creative people and, and radical artists began to sniff out alternatives. You know, the sort of thing, the swinging 60s, the Beatles, the so-called summer of love. They're all perhaps symptoms of this, but here I'd like to focus on some almost forgotten protests, dreams, searches, visions. One of these, for instance, was the Fun Palace, dreamed up by the radical theatre director Joan Littlewood. This was Littlewood's Laboratory of Pleasure, or University of the Streets. It was to be housed in a single building, which was to be a flexible megastructure incorporating a fun arcade, a science playground, a plastic area for touching, handling, creating in wood and metal or paint or clay, stone, textiles. Its essence was to be informality and adaptability and central to it was to be a theatre, an acting space with no division between the performers and the audience. The architect was Cedric Price, who, I quote, planned for an open, steel-gridded structure that could support a completely flexible program. Hanging rooms for dancing, music and drama, mobile floors, walls, ceilings and walkways, and advanced temperature systems that could disperse and control fog, warm air and moisture. They were all intended to promote active fun. The design was worked on from 1961 and in 1964 it was included in the Civic Trust's Lee Valley Development Plan, but sadly it was never constructed. Perhaps more typical of this post-war awakening were a number of unexpected festivals which were held in the early 1960s, such as those organised by Centre 42. Centre 42 took its name from Resolution 42, passed by the Trade Union Congress in 1960, though without the backing of the General Council, it might be noted. And the resolution urged people's greater participation in cultural life. So, in 1961, Wellingborough Trades Council approached Centre 42 to invite them to stage an arts festival there, which happened in November of that year. And in 1962, six more festivals were organised, another in Wellingborough and others in Leicester, Nottingham, Birmingham, Bristol and Hazen Harlington. Pubs, schools, arts centres, factory canteens, art galleries, they all hosted events such as folk music concerts, jazz concerts, art exhibitions, poetry readings, and various kinds of performances. The National Youth Theatre, for instance, presented Hamlet, as well as Arnold Wesker's play about the Luddites, The Nottingham Captain, and Burning Copses Into Solly Gold. Most ambitious, probably, was Charles Parker's multimedia documentary, The Maker and the Tool, a show adapted to the local industry of each place it was presented in and created with strong input from local trade unionists. But Centre 42's festivals lost money, nearly £40,000 in all, which was a lot in 1961 or 62, and disagreements, ideological and personal, among the leaders led to the effective end of Centre 42. Different in form, but just as radical, perhaps more radical, in practice, 
was the annual Festival of Fools, organized and directed by Ewan McCall. This festival was held every January for several years in the New Merlin's Cave near King's Cross, in a room which already contained a small stage, but two further stages were added to give three acting areas, and sophisticated sound and lighting equipment were also installed. In the show itself, each month of the past year would be introduced by a weather rhyme or a piece of folk wisdom, followed by a major scene based on something that had happened in that month in the previous year. Funny, tragic, frightening, satirical. Quick skits, long complicated ones, songs, jokes, dances, and then the show would close with perhaps a poem or a reprise of the wassail song. The form, a series of short self-contained scenes, was thus parallel to that of Music Hall or an entertainment at a working men's club, though with a much sharper satirical edge, of course. The American war in Vietnam was an enduring topic, as was South African apartheid, Enoch Powell's racism, etc., etc. There was one famous fairy tale that was staged, Little Blue Riding Hood, besieged by the wolf of communism, <laughs> and so on. The hippies of, summer, of the summer of love were an easy target. I used to be committed man, switched on as I could be, and every Easter I'd be marching with the CND. But now I sport a fleur-de-lis that's painted on Miss Nout. I am one of the flower people now, for I have opted out. However, perhaps the iconic cultural event of this period was Margareta Darcy and John Arden's festival known as Kirby Moorside 63, after the village of Kirby Moorside in Yorkshire where they were living. This festival lasted for weeks in August and September 1963. It was open-ended, arts-based and cost nothing. Darcy and Arden invited progressive artists, writers, musicians and others to participate for no fee, I should add, but were most interested in attracting the involvement of local people. And local people came to enjoy performances, improvisations, games and dancing, unstructured evenings lasting four or five hours. John Arden and Margareta Darcy had left behind the refinements of London's Royal Court Theatre where their professional careers had effectively started. Their latest experiments had included the community nativity play The Business of Good Government, a children's play The Royal Pardon, and the extraordinary history play about Horatio Lord Nelson, The Hero Rises Up, when they had attempted to wrong foot the management of the ICA, which was producing the play, by refusing to charge for entry. More provocative still was Ars Longa Vita Brevis, a short play of just a dozen pages in print. In truth, the authors say, it's not exactly a play, nor is it anything else in particular. They suggest it might be called a theme for variations and its skeletal script virtually forces actors to improvise. The piece opens at St. Uncumber's School. Uncumber was the bearded female patron saint of women who wished to be free from their abusive husbands. The headmaster at the school laments the lack of an art teacher. Later he appoints Mr. Miltiades to teach art. This man is obsessed with preventing the children from becoming sloppy and so undisciplined. He insists they draw geometric figures in their art classes with rulers. When this fails to produce the results he requires, he starts to drill them, turning them into an army until the headmaster intervenes. He suggests Mr. Miltiades join the territorial army. And when Mr. No, Miltiades gets home. His wife asks what happened at school, but before he can explain, the territorials are heard outside, they're recruiting, and Mr. Miltiades joins them and goes on manoeuvres in the woods with them. But when a shooting party enters the woods, the headmaster, one of the party, mistakes Mr. Miltiades for a stag and shoots him dead. 
a subscription is taken up for his white widow, who uses the money to buy clothes, food, wine, a new house, and enjoys herself in fast cars with innumerable young men. She meets his funeral. I shed a tear upon his beer, because to me he was ever dear, but I could not follow him in all his wishes. I prefer the quick, easy swimming of the fishes, which sport and play in green water all day, and have not a straight line in the whole of their bodies. Ars Langa Vita Brevis is pivotal in the art of John Arden and Margareta Darcy, because not only does it work on several levels, it also seems to be presented as almost conventional theatre, yet it's, it's something much less formal, less expected than that. A superficial reading of it suggests that, oh, it's a satire on the art master, Mr Miltiades, who's an almost caricatured fascist, apparently, whose fanatical strictness contrasts with the spontaneity and freedom of the children and of Roxana, his wife. But actually, the piece is much subtler than this. In the classroom scene, for instance, the children somehow become terrifying, and Mr Miltiades is so helpless before them that he begins to evoke pity while the class becomes a sort of fiendish nightmare. It's a refusal to rely on easy audience responses that makes all these works by Arden and Darcy so compellingly rich. And that's carried over into Kirby Moore's side 63. The true genesis of art, Ars Longa Vita Brevis, lies in the cultural world embodied in Kirby Moore's side 63. Kirby Moore's side was something of a cultural backwater, I suppose. The economy was based in agriculture, but the people were not rich. Most of them attended one of the five different denominational churches. The village had a little over 2,000 inhabitants, but with the nearest theatre over 30 miles away and the nearest cinema seven miles distant, their local entertainment, especially since the railway had been closed, hardly extended beyond one of the six pubs there. There was also a more or less defunct youth club and a market which was held once a week. That was the extent of the cultural life of the village. Arden and Darcy's cottage was on the outskirts in a funny little collection of houses that ran along by a disused railway and a disused gas works. You must be mad coming here, one young mother scolded them. Kirby's dead. All he's good for is dying. To the locals, Arden and Darcy were clearly eccentric. They had no telephone, no radio and no television. The local police even seemed to find Arden suspicious because of his long hair, and he was questioned more than once. Their lifestyle was unconventional in the extreme. The avant-garde publisher John Calder remembered visiting them on a sunny Saturday morning. The small Arden children, cherubic crawlers and toddlers, were all naked, playing in the dust near a main road with no fences and fast traffic. I kept picking them up and bringing them back to their cottage. But John and Margareta were unconcerned. They let the children go where they wanted, heedless of the dangers. But to Darcy, life in the country had one great advantage. Quote, it meant creating one's own entertainment. Moving into a village just because the rent was low was a bit arrogant. What had we to offer? The answer turned out to be the event which has come to be known as Kirby Moorside 63. The idea for this was Darcy's. She wanted to open up the town to offer an open-ended arts-based event lasting over weeks in her own home. It would cost nothing. Anyone who wanted to come could do so, either to create or to watch others create, or to discuss, argue, suggest, criticise, or simply to be there. And once it was underway, very many local people did attend, 70 or 8 of, of them, almost every night. At the beginning of each evening, people would wander into the house, help themselves to cups of tea in the kitchen, and then sit and chat easily while waiting for whatever might happen. Things usually commenced with one or two more or less formal presentations, 
though hardly formal by conventional standards. People sat round the living room while a foreign film or a silent comedy was projected, or a visiting theatre troupe presented their piece, or a group of local children performed. There might be music, or a poetry reading, or perhaps simply a discussion and argument. A fire-eater was a permanent fixture, though he performed outside, as was the potter who built a kiln for himself in the garden. There were readings from Brecht, Machiavelli, Sean O'Casey and others, and one highlight was the plays improvised from newspaper headlines. Arden's army sergeant, who forced his wife to tickle her feet, his feet for hours on end and thereby drove her to the divorce courts, was one such well-remembered impromptu. Later in the evening, there was dancing, often to rock and roll music, and the evening ended at two or even three in the morning, only to be repeated the next night. The politics, or perhaps the ideology, of Kirby Moorside 63 was suggested by the posters on the living room walls, propaganda posters from the Communist Party and the Conservative Party, a picture of Queen Victoria and a poster for world peace, as well as an old-fashioned sign, God bless our home. It suggests Arden was correct when later he wrote of the festival being based on broadly libertarian anarchistic artistic views, adding that its politics were implicit rather than overt. No one was told to do anything except perhaps to create. Kirby Moore's Site 63 was therefore inherently subversive. This was neither theatre nor a party. It was neither a public event nor a private one. It was betwixt and between, liminal, beyond categorization. Openness, lack of dogmatism and leaderlessness were built into it so that its debates were genuine and its events valid. No artist or animateur directed them. Being non-judgmental, it was not judged, merely enjoyed. Anarchistic it may have been theoretically, but it may be better to classify it as a Dionysian carnival. It was disruptive, even interventionist, yet with the lightest of hearts and the lightest of touches. So the 60s evolved its own cultural norms, inflected at least partly by the kind of radical or non-conforming attitudes displayed in some of these alternative festivals. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.